Our first uh, speaker today for this session is our illustrious leader and good friend, uh, <laughs> Paul Saraja, who's giving a keynote on my wish list for the rollout of transcatheter TR. Thank you, Molly, and uh, uh, welcome. And it's, uh, a, a again, a real pleasure to be here and see all of you here uh, uh, for this uh, TR Squared Symposium. So uh, I've been asked uh, to speak uh, about uh, my wish list for the rollout of transcatheter tricuspid therapy. And this, this talk, it's, it's, giving, it's being given in the context of anticipated commercial approval. You know, we, we do believe that we're going to have a tricuspid therapy on the market, whatever that might be. Uh, here very soon, and, uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about what I would like to see uh, as kind of a wish list for that uh, eventual commercial launch. Those are my disclosures. The most important disclosure is that I am one of the national PIs for the Trilimate uh, Pivotal Clinical Trial. So, so my first wish on this wish list is that when we look at a patient like this, we think about what's meaningful. And so this is a 79-year-old woman who uh, I had been seeing with fatigue and edema for a long time. She had had previous mitral surgery, previous bypass, and she had had TR that was severe for many years. And we, if we think about this 79-year-old, what, what are we exactly trying to achieve? And, and what I would like to wish for is that, and this is what this patient asks, is they just want quality of life. And not just only want, but to value quality of life as a meaningful benefit. There's been a lot of criticism about quality of life as a patient-reported outcome in the clinical trial. But, you know, we have a lot of experience in treating these patients, and it means a lot to these patients. And when we look at what we're trying to do, you know, we know that uh, these transcat therapies can be effective, they can be safe. Uh, you all are likely familiar with the Trilluminate data. Uh, low MAE rates, low bleeding, low PACER rates, and the study was positive only because of quality of life. And what I would love to see is that we think about quality of life as a patient report outcome in a different light, uh, that it's not a placebo because we have studied this to death, then we don't think it's a placebo, and we're looking at ways of demonstrating that further. And, and you know, when you look at that quality of life and look at the survival of these patients, it turns out that these patients actually can live with their TR even when it's massive and torrential. I, I won't sit here and say that they're going to live forever. I think that's really naive. But it's actually quite surprising that when they have left-sided disease that's well managed, that the one-year mortality is in the single digits, even when the TR is massive and torrential. And, you know, cardiovascular death rate of 4.7%, that's impossible to improve upon in a, in a clinical trial unless that trial's in the tens of thousands. It, it would be really, really difficult. And when we look at the survival of these patients in, the, in that context, this is a, the slide that many of you have likely have seen before. You know, you know, historically, when we looked at the clinical trials that reported high mortality with TR, those, tr those studies were all in the context of unmanaged left-sided valvular heart disease. So in blue are those studies. And those are the studies that actually were used to inform the design of Triluminate because we all thought that mortality was going to be 20 to 50 percent per year. Well, that turns out not to be the case. So in the past several years while Triluminate has been going on, in yellow, there have been multiple studies of TR in patients with well-managed left-sided disease. And the one-year mortality for those studies have been about 7 to 14 percent. And Triluminate sits smack dab in the middle. Uh, of that, of those studies that you can see here. So I think we have to think about TR and right-sided disease differently from left-sided disease, uh, but it's still uh, have that value about quality of life. My second wish list uh, for uh, the role of these therapies is that there's a learning curve that evolves and continues to evolve. So on the left-hand side, I already showed this about TR reduction, uh, but on the right-hand side, these are the studies that have happened in the past three years with core lab adjudicated data that start with the earliest TR experience with TIR and finishing with the latest experience that just came out this past May with the commercial experience in Europe. And my point of this is to show that with experience in three years in core lab adjudicated data that the TR reduction has become better and better. And in the latest data, 70% of the patients in Europe are getting mild TR less. And this is a 500-patient, all-comers study. 
and, and that's very important. It's an all commerce study, and it's just as safe, the safety profile. And I think hopefully this is only the floor, not the ceiling. I think we're going to continue to see things get even better uh, as we uh, get more experience with this therapy, and I think that's part of my wish list. And I think in order for that to happen, there's going to have to be more expertise in tricuspid imaging. Um, yesterday, we spent a whole day talking about ICE and TE. There's going to be a lot of training that's going to be going on in this. And I think it's a very fruitful way of looking at things. My third wish for TR patients in this rollout is that I wish there were fewer patients who had pacemaker and ICD leads in TR. You know, there are millions of these devices that are being put in every year. Imaging is almost never performed when we implant these devices. We, we have no idea what TR is happening when we put these devices in. And the problem with this is that they show up in clinic five to 10 years after the device is put in with their TR. And they always ask me, well, you're telling me my lead is impinging my tricuspid valve open and it's keeping it open. Well, I've had this pacemaker in for 10 years. Why didn't I know about this 10 years ago? Well, it's because they man they've been managed to skirt on by with diuretic therapies, fly under the radar, and we have a total underappreciation at the time of the implant, but they show up in clinic later. And it's an incredibly difficult discussion because when these patients come with these leads, this is how the, the conversations go. We have a, an intense discussion about a risk of extraction. And if you could play that far left image, you know, these risks are not trivial. If you play that, could you play that far left video for me? I just click on that. Does anybody see what, what happened there? Um, the risks of extraction are not trivial. So we talk about that. We talk about, well, if we leave the lead in, can we repair around it, like in the middle panel? And then the final video on the far right is a patient that Vinny and I took care of where we just decided to entrap the lead. But then that raises all kind of questions about, well, what if the lead gets infected? What are we going to do at that point and such? The far left uh, uh, video, if that were to play, that's a papillary muscle rupture. Uh, that happen with the lead extraction. So these, these risks are real, and these are very difficult discussions to have. It'd be much easier if these patients just simply didn't exist, uh, if we just didn't have TR with the leads. My fourth wish uh, for this rollout would be that uh, we don't accept just symptoms and patient reported outcomes on face value, that we have some way of explaining that improvement in quality of life and symptoms. And so uh, these are data from Triluminate, and I mentioned this in the last session, that it doesn't matter whether you go from mild, uh, sorry, uh, three to one or five to three or four to two. If you drop by two grades, there's a quality of life improvement of about 18 points. And when we look at that, this quality of life improvement, it's, it's very difficult to measure for a lot of these patients. This is a, a text message I got from the uh, president of my group Dr. Bill Katsianis, who said, I just saw my TR patient that you clipped last year, and he's so happy because he can put my pants on. Uh, and, uh, and how do we measure that? You know, Because all the quality of life measures are for left side of disease. They're all validated for left side of disease. But what, how do we measure quality of life for right side? We, we really are just at the beginning stage of that. And if you look at what he says in that quote there, it's it's they're happy because they have skinny legs. Skinny legs is not a question. You know, edema is a question, but you know, how skinny your legs are. It's, it's very difficult to quantify, but this is an example of, well, how do we measure and understand that effect a little bit better? Uh, these are courtesy of, of my wonderful partner, uh, Dr. Joao Cavacante. And what Joao did is he actually said, well, let's look at the anus a little bit more. So on the right-hand side, this is a patient before and after triclip. And you can see that with triclip, the analyst actually becomes more saddle shaped. It becomes much more like what the patient probably had many years ago with this saddle shaped configuration in this one example. It's an anecdote, but it's an example of what might happen. And on the right hand side is another example. This is a patient who got clipped and had an ICD implant, but the RV went from uh, an RV volume of 237 to an RV end volume of 166. And Joao says he can measure two mLs with MRI. I don't know how he can measure two mLs. I don't even know if I could do that with my teaspoon, but he says you can. But the effect is the patient's asymptomatic and the RV is shrunk. And that's the most important thing. And so there, 
there must be some explanation for the way that why these patients feel better. And I hope that as we continue to see this therapy emerge and grow, that we understand that insight a little bit better. And then the final wish that I would have for this therapy, or any of these tricuspid therapies as they roll out, is that we see a halo effect of not just these as the only therapy that's out there. So if we look now, and Steve Bowling mentioned this in the last session, is that there are very few patients already undergoing tricuspid therapy in the United States. You know, it's, it's several hundred per year. And that really hasn't changed a whole lot. Maybe it's gone up a little bit, but it really hasn't changed a whole lot. And so these patients have limited options and it's often at high risk. And you look at all the technologies out there, there are so many that are coming out. And my wish list is that something like this in the far right happens. Now this graph in the far right is not a tricuspid graph, it's a mitral clip graph. And it's a graph of what happened in Germany when mitral clip was introduced. And when mitral clip was introduced, there's all this grave concern that, well, it's gonna gobble up all mitral surgeries. Well, that, that isn't a, that's not what happened. Actually, the opposite of what happened is that when mitral clip was introduced, other mitral procedures and life-saving things that patients had grew. So in orange, if you look at the volume of things that were mitral surgical, and you look at the blue in the bottom, the introduction of mitral clip, the volume of things in Germany grew a lot. And so there's this halo effect that brought patients to clinic, brought patients to procedure who otherwise wouldn't have the attention of our physicians in our group. So that, that's my final wish for this. So in summary, my wish list for transcatheter tricuspid as it rolls out, I, I hope we embrace quality of life as an important, meaningful benefit because I do believe it's different for right versus left side. I hope that we continue to grow that learning curve for proceduralists and imagers. I really would love to see fewer patients with TR in the presence of ICD and pacemaker leads. These are just so difficult to manage. I hope we gain insight into what we're actually doing to our patients, not just treating TR by itself, but what does that do to the pathophysiology, pathophysiology of these patients? And then finally, I hope that what we do by introducing these therapies is create a halo effect that raises all boats uh, in the sea. So thank you very much. So let's start um, first off. Um, Paul or Vinny, um, either one of you can answer this. So quality of life is what, uh, what made uh, Triluminate positive. And as I said in the last session, um, even with good surgical results for tricuspid at one year, we still didn't have the same results at five years. So what are we missing? Why is it that we, we didn't make a, a change in, in mortality? Well, I mean, as I mentioned before, the, the mortality rates were not high. So, so the one-year cardiovascular mortality rate in a control arm was 4.7%. And it's really hard to improve upon mortality of that. Less than 5%, you need a really large pharmaceutical trial. I mean, it's a, a trial of 350 patients with just one year follow-up is just not gonna cut it. So, so uh, you know, could we have a larger trial? Could we have different devices? Absolutely, we could study this a little bit more. But it turns out, you know, in Triluminate, again, there was a mandatory right heart cath. And that mandatory right heart cath was used to exclude patients with unmanaged left-sided disease. If the wedge pressure was more than 20 at end expiration, which means if the mean was more than 16 at, um, uh, millimeters of mercury, the, there was a patient management committee that individually reviewed every tracing and said that, that well, no matter what you say at the wedges, they're gonna review the tracings. If they see that wedge pressure elevated, they excluded the patient. So, so and we did that because we had to study TR without anything else. If we, if we didn't do that, it would not be science. You know, you'd be, you'd be studying TR in the context of unmanaged AS or HEF-PEF or whatever. It would not be scientific. So we had to exclude those patients to understand it. So we, when we brought TR by itself, and it's not that these patients didn't have left-sided disease. 37 of them were re-ops. These patients had left-sided disease, but when we brought TR by itself, the mortality wasn't there we were way off on our mortality estimates. And, and the trial was initially powered 
such that you could not win a quality of life alone. But it turns out we did because a quality of life benefit was so high. Do you think at, if you looked at these patients in five, or in five years, do you think they're, so say you had more patients yeah. and we had longer uh, outcome. If you had a crystal ball, do you think these, this therapy will decrease mortality just in general? Well, I, I, I got to believe, and I, I, you know, I'm sorry to sound like a broke record because I think I said this earlier this morning, is that symptomatic severe anything is going to hurt a patient at some point. Mm -hmm. We just don't know when. And I think one year is just too soon. You know, even in COAP, it took two years for a left-sided life-threatening valve problem to emerge for, for a therapy benefit. TR, one year, I mean, that's, that's a really short window. And will we see it at two years? I actually doubt it. But class and, and, and TRISEN are two-year endpoints, so we're going to learn from those studies. Uh, I think it's going to be more of a three- to five-year horizon. But unfortunately, the cat's out of the bag. No one's going to do a randomized trial at this point, unless we're forced to for that time period. So I think, Paul, you made a really important point. I think, so quality of life may be, in my mind, okay today. But as we progress in future, I think we have to start thinking of why not treat these patients sooner. So in oncology trials, when uh, drugs are given to you know, advanced cancers, their quality of life drops down, but actually survival increases. So it's a slightly different yes, philosophy, but is. I think we are at the end of the food chain. We are treating these patients too late. Yeah. I think the critical part now is, can we treat these patients sooner? How to get these patients from heart failure, cardiology, yeah. and that will really show the benefit, I think, of this therapy. Yeah. I completely agree, and thankfully, we've at least achieved the safety margin we wanted to, because if we hadn't achieved that safety margin, any prophylactic therapy would be off the table. And so, so at least we're in the ballpark in terms of the safety to, to allow that consideration. So. so I'm gonna throw out another, maybe more provocative, uh, well, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, so, so Paul, again, trying to be a little provocative about this. And so the naysayers uh, in the field obviously question the benefit in terms of quality of life without a sham control. Because uh, a lot of this is obviously uh, uh, complicit on patients getting a procedure and the nocebo effect, as they call it. Uh, and, and a lot of that is often quoted as one of the drawbacks of the clinical trial. And the second big drawback that people talk about is the large number of exclusion criteria based on echocardiographic features in the trial, which then limits the external validity or the generalizability of the study when it gets rolled out commercially, where people are getting clips left, right, and center in the tricuspid position with and without ICD leads, with and without full understanding of anatomy, and people are getting hurt. So just a comment on both those. So, so I'm glad you asked those questions. So, so for the placebo effect, it, it's a very fair criticism. You know, um, I mean, we've learned from multiple clinical trials, including PCI, which we still continue to do, despite uh, some recent sham uh, controlled negative studies. Um, you know, a couple of things on that. Um, uh, there's no way to go back and redo that unless you redo the trial. But what I would say is that uh, we looked hard, and uh, usually a placebo effect, you see a waning. There was no waning effect whatsoever. The change in quality of life was the same at three, six, nine, and 12 months. And so, so I would agree with you that, that it's a concern, but we at least haven't seen a signal of it. The other thing that we didn't see a signal with regards to that is patients will know if they got the device or not. Physicians will know if they got the device or not. One thing that patients may or may not know is how much reduction they got. So that's why we did the TR grades by quality of life. And that's for all. It's all device and control. So if you got TR grade reduction by one or two from medical therapy, you also had quality of life improvement of that same degree. And so, so, so yeah, patients may know that they did get TR reduction, but do they really know how many grades and how they graded themselves? Probably not. So that, that helps some, but the final thing I would say is it's going to come down to physiology. So, so if, if, if I showed you what Joao showed, that the RV shrinks 
in the patients who got treated, but it, it grows in the patients who got control, that would be helpful. You know, so, so those, we have to understand the physiology of what we're doing, and that's, that's, why, that's part of my wish list. The, the, about your question about the screen failure rate, so it actually was one of the most successful screen success trials in the history of cardiovascular medicine because 49% of those patients submitted were approved. And it turns out that among the 51% who were not approved, the most common reason for exclusion was because the TR was not severe enough. It was like moderate. So, so it actually, the majority of patients submitted were actually approved. And, 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 and the, in terms of the inclusion criteria, ICD leads and pacemaker leads, 15 to 25%, not all patients. Gaps had to be less than 10. There are anatomical limits for the device, but for the most part, most patients actually got approved. So, and we'll, we'll learn more about the single arm data, hopefully soon too. So um, what I was going to ask kind of change, and I don't know how popular this question will be or if it's even appropriate, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, because why not? Um, <laughs> so, so say this gets approved off of quality life, quality of life alone as the, um, you know, as the benefit. So what does this mean to other trials and other, I mean, we're, we're here to help patients feel better, right? Because yeah. we're physicians. Live longer is a, is a good thing too. But as good stewards of, of healthcare and of the economics of healthcare, what would this do to other trials? Would they change their outcomes? Would mortality not be needed? And what would that mean to, to our healthcare yeah. system? So it's interesting. So the, the FDA, at least the temperature that people have started to take, is that they're, they've really warmed up to patient reported outcomes. And remember, th this trial was designed with the FDA input. They wanted KCCQ in there, not as a secondary endpoint, but as part of the primary. And it's also the case for the other TR trials as well. So, so the patient report outcome, it would not be in the primary endpoint if the FDA did not feel it was important. And so I think it does have serious implications if, it were, if it's approved just on quality of life alone. But I started with that case in the beginning because I just asked, in a 79-year-old who's already achieved the average life expectancy of an average American without whatever diseases, of all, whatever all comers there is, what else are they living for if they've already achieved the average age of 80? Is it important that we have to show that they now can live to 90? I, I'm not sure. At least in our clinics, the patients don't ask for that. They just want to feel better tomorrow. And, and, and it's, it's a very different perspective. And I, we're going to learn a lot as we go through the approval process for this therapy, and we're going to learn where things land. But, but it's, it's a really important question. She kind of didn't answer the question, so I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, I did answer no. it. Yeah. No. What will it do to the economics of healthcare? So yeah, so we have a whole bunch of well, I, the today. economics. I, I'll tell you this: there, there are Alzheimer's drugs, there are prostate cancer drugs, there are oncology drugs that are being approved that cost four times more than the price of our devices, and patients get to live an extra three months. So I, I have to say, I don't think that matters. It's brutal. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes. I, I just wanted to make two yeah. comments, one on the quality of life aspect yeah. and the other one on why do we see, you know, the, the improvement so late in the trials. On the quality of life aspect, I think it is really important. And as surgeons, being a surgeon myself, I think we need to do a much better job collecting this data, yeah. both in our registry as well in our, our trials, because it really does matter. I also think it's challenging in a trial like Triluminate because we all are su subject to an optimism bias. The reason people go buy chips and Coke at the halftime show is because we are all susceptible to that, right? Yeah. So knowing what you got treated with will affect yeah. these outcomes. So that's a very difficult, but also very important challenge to overcome. That's true. The other part, you know, you had mentioned, why do we see differences in these trials so late? And I want to tie this in with what Vinny said about are we doing too much, uh, too little, too late? Yeah. I think yes, we're doing too little, too late. The reason we're seeing that difference is late is because in the first two years, all the really sick patients are dying away. So that unmasks then those who have a better survival chance. Yeah. 
and will make it more possible to discern these less you know, obvious changes in, in, in outcomes, especially quality of life. So if everybody has died in the first two years that was just really sick and it was too little, too late, then you start seeing it, which gets back to the point that we need to do more sooner. Yeah. Okay, Great we need points. to move on to the Thank next. Um, Jonathan Schwartz will be presenting a case. Is he here? All right, thank you. It's always hard to follow Paul regardless of where you're at, but particularly when it's at his meeting, so I'll do my best here. But, um, so the topic assigned to me was complex transcatheter repair. Complex can mean a lot of different things. I tried to find a case that was a little bit unique in terms of what that was, so more disclosures there. So this is an 84-year-old male with progressive dyspnea exertion, some pretty bad edema, and a drastic decline in his activities over the last few months. Lots of comorbidities. He previously under, had, underwent SAVR with a sternotomy back in 94. Some coronary disease, heart failure, hypertension, all the things. Interestingly and important for this case, he has May Thurner syndrome and underwent bilateral iliac vein stenting and then also has an esophageal stricture. That's required some dilation in the past. It was felt to be optimized after some many visits in the heart failure clinic and some persistent symptoms despite these meds. So he came to me in clinic. I had an angiogram and a transthoracic echo. You can see pretty clearly pretty bad TR there, no significant coronary disease, a couple things here or there, but nothing too bad. TE was ordered after this and after multiple attempts with one of our structural imagers that's very good about trying things and persistently they still weren't able to pass it. So concern for access not only from the legs but also from the throat. So we got a couple studies to try to see what's going on. Um, barium swallow didn't really show anything. GI was not helpful. Uh, and we did get a contrast CT venogram to make sure that the stents were patent. They look like we probably would be able to get through, but um, it was going to be a little bit borderline. So after another attempt with a different imager um, and a lot of anesthesia, we were able to get a TE down. Um, could see, again, pretty bad TR, um, some tethering of the septal leaflet and a little bit of prolapse of the anterior leaflet there. So based on these things, oh, we also got a right heart cath. Not, not too bad, pretty well optimized with meds, but still very symptomatic despite this. So to summarize where we're at so far, severe TR with normal RV function, multiple jets with, with a restricted septal leaflet and some anterior leaflet prolapse, a large valve with no gradient issues, and then the bilateral iliac vein stents that extend from the lower IVC to the confluence, and a stricture that we were able to get a TE across, but it took a little bit of effort. So. Based on this, the challenge now, what's the optimal medical or management strategy, surgical, you'd have to do redo sternotomy, the patient really wasn't interested in that. If it's transcatheter, get through the stents and then see if we can get some good imaging, try just meds. I think we all are here because we know that that's not gonna be the case, but any panelists, any choices here? Yes, surgery is always a choice and nobody wants it, right? I mean, that's different. I think there are many transcatheter options as well, and he's 84, um, he has other comorbidities. Uh, this is like a Swiss cheese effect, you've got multiple layers of problems, so you may get away with doing what you did, which you're going to show us later. Uh, but I think with new therapies which are coming, which could be like trick valve, for example, or other, other solutions, uh, should be also considered in these type of patients. For sure. We don't always have to do it. That's a good point. You don't always have to do a reduced sternotomy either. Right. There's there's other ways to get into the heart and surgify it. True. It's a surgery. <laughs> it is still a surgery. So okay. <laughs> so we had our meeting. Uh, we did think transcatheter um, edge to edge repair would be appropriate, and um, we were going to use TE and 3D ice as adjunctive imaging here um, with a cautious approach as we go through the stents with a septal anterior approach. Thought we'd probably need multiple clips. Um, we did anticipate there was a good chance we, there might be some residual TR given how tethered the septal leaflet was. Uh, had the heart team, everyone agreed, uh, and after extensive discussion with the patient, making sure that they were aware of the expectations and the risks, uh, he wanted to proceed. So started out, the TE probe, again, took a little bit of effort, but we was able to get it passed. Pretty much the same imaging that we saw before, no big changes there. I hate to be anticlimactic, but this was the part that I was kind of most worried about, and you can see both um, the 
clip delivery system on the right side there went through relatively easily. It took a little bit of maneuvering of the wire, but after I got the wire through, no trouble. And then the ice probe that actually hung up just a little bit, but got that through the stents as well. So at that point, I thought the hard part was over, which it pretty much was. Um, I do show, so here, um, the TE uh, with the on phos view, it's just showing where the leak is. I do like to look at the hepatic veins on the way up. I think that's one place where ice really shines as you can get some nice um, imaging that shows reversal of flow in the liver there on the right side. Um, so we've got an ice picture on the left and a TE on the right here, positioning uh, or getting ready to bring the clip in there right over where the TR is. You can see the leaflets pretty well with TE on the left and with ice you can see very well leaflets falling in pretty nicely. And at one point one of the leaflets did get stuck behind the gripper there on the left but um, was able to navigate out of that and got one clip on. You can still see quite a bit of residual TR there so went in with another clip right next to it focusing on where um, the leak was. Was able to get that clip on as well pretty much basically mild, maybe mild to moderate TR left uh, with a nice 3D ice image on the right there. And uh, the on phosphate shows just not too much TR left, so we're pretty happy with the result with two clips. One month post-op, patient was doing very well. Uh, was, you know, you probably aren't quite capturing all the TR on the transthoracic, but basically traced a mild TR that's left and he did well. So I think with precise planning, you can get success with potentially cases that were difficult. Ultimately, this one didn't end up being as tough as it could have been. Um, and multimodality imaging really helped here. Uh, and then as well, making sure that you kind of review things with your heart team. So definitely like to link my imager. Marcus Schur couldn't be here today, but thank you. Jonathan, brilliant case. And if suppose on the table, uh, you were not able to pass TE. What was your plan of action? Like you had really good ice images. Uh, would you advocate in such patients to try the ice first, see you've got good imaging, then get the TE if it doesn't go? Like what's your like stepwise approach here? Yeah, so there's a few different options there. Um, there is another, so the patient had already been intubated at this point, but if you're worried about that, there is a special, it's like an LMA that has a little um, a separate probe that you can put the TE probe through. Sometimes that helps. Um, 3D pediatric probes aren't quite available yet, but they're coming out, so um, the caliber is a little bit smaller. That, that's another way to try. We have had great success with 3D ice so far, so the plan that we were just going to try with 3D ice and see how far we could get, and if we had to stop, you can always try later. So. That's always an option. I think based, you, I could go back, I guess, but um, the angulation of the left side looked a little harder to get through the stent, and so that's we thought the right was going to be easier, and it ended up working. So. We had a GEE symposium, and it came out with the mini TEE, which is a 4D uh, T, uh, mini TEE, which is kind of 57% volume reduction than your TEE probe. Um, I tried it for the left atrial appendage cases. I think it's really nice, easy on the esophagus, something that I think the vendors now are endorsing, and with the others as well. So I think it's in the horizon, and I think it's, it's FDA approved for the GE, so something to think about. Yeah, that's great. I think yeah, the next few months here, we're going to have a lot more options. So. Absolutely. Okay, I think we're going to try to get back on time. My fault, sorry. Um, our next case will be Valen, Valve and Valve Challenge by Soon Ali. Uh, Good afternoon, or oh, morning. Morning. Uh, Sean Ali from Charlotte. I think uh, Paul had the North Carolina guys together. Happy to follow Jonathan. Um, so, you know, Paul assigns these cases and uh, said, well, ultimate tricuspid valve and valve challenge. Uh, most of my tricuspid cases are fairly straightforward, but I had an older case that I wanted to share with people who find it uh, uh, interesting. I have no disclosures for this talk. So we have a young guy uh, that came in, 
It's an older case with uh, 50 pound weight gain and heart failure symptoms. He's had two prior episodes of uh, tricuspid valve and for some reason, surgeons have replaced this tricuspid valve twice, initially with a 31 and a 29 mosaic prosthesis. Um, you know, when I talk to our surgeons, you know, most times they do not replace those valves. They just, you know, cut it out just because of this reason. They will end up going back and infecting the valves. But he had done well until he presented back to our facility. Uh, he's obese. He's got a ton of edema. Uh, he's got large air waves on his jugular waveform. Uh, some mom over the tricuspid valve area, clear lung fields, and typical edema and distended abdomen. Um, you know, he comes in, gets antibiotics. You know, the thought was, okay, probably needs to go back to the OR. But before he could, we could get him there, is that rapid decline? It becomes markedly hypotensive. He's on, he's now in cardiogenic shock with vasopressor support. He goes on dialysis. He's a multi-organ failure. Um, I do not have the uh, echo images here uh, on initial uh, exam, but. He's got severe airway dilation, gradients of 17 across the tricuspid valve, and the TEE reveals large mobile vegetations and fusion of the leaflets. Um, so this guy is in shock. The surgeons are like, well, we're not going to take him. He's too sick to go to the OR. Uh, we bring him to the lab um, to think of doing something for him. And these are his waveforms. What you see here is obviously significant elevation of this right atrial waveform, which is actually higher than the right ventricular waveform. Uh, his wedge is obviously normal because he has no preload on the left side and a normal PA uh, waveform. So we did put an intracardiac ultrasound echo in just to see what's going on with the valve. And this is the, this is the issue. It's got significant uh, stenosis of his tricuspid valve. Let me go back. And um, and that's what you, we see. So the question is, what do we do for this young man? He's in shock. He's on pressors. So this is active endocarditis. Active endocarditis. Which what's that suction gadget you guys use? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah, so people have used the inari uh, things to, to suck you know, okay. the, you know, stuff out of the right atrium. This was an older case before the inari became readily uh, available. Uh, but what we did was just to balloon this valve, which I will show on the next slide. Uh, basically, just did a, a valvuloplasty. We knew that we, we were probably going to embolize you know, material to the lungs. But in this patient with you know, severe shock and active endocarditis, that's, that's what we saw. Uh, not fun images, uh, but the good news is that actually he made good recovery after this. It, it's a, a simple procedure for a patient in shock, kind of worked out well for him. This is uh, his uh, post-procedure hemodynamics. Now he's got more feeling of his right ventricle. Um, you know, he did require some intermittent hemodialysis. He went on IV antibiotics and came back for a redo operation. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the learnings from this is it's definitely an uncommon cause of tricuspid valve stenosis. We do have options, including uh, palliative valvuloplasty, or you use an inari or one of those suction uh, thrombectomy catheters to remove clot. We've, you know, we've done a few of those in the right atrium and tricuspid valve. But, you know, as been said in this meeting, intracardiac ultrasound has become a very useful tool. This was done way before 3D, 4D eyes. Uh, but even the 2D eye scatter can give you enough imaging on the right side to, to help patients. Uh, I thank you for your attention. So, Dr. Bowling, I think you have some comments. So, I just, just want to say I hate this case in so many ways, I can't tell you. But so, I do have a couple of questions. I mean, did, was this a planned bridge to another surgery? It was a, it was a, it was more palliative to get to see if we could help the patient because the guy was dying. Yeah, so we would never do a second time redo endocarditis because the data on that is very clear from surgery. Whether you operate on them or do not operate on them, their mortality is exactly the same. Because if you're the second time in and you're still using drugs, you have a very, very, very bad disease 
And it's not your tricuspid valve. Absolutely. It's your addiction. So these people, <clears throat> it is futile to operate on them. Now, that makes it even worse when we have percutaneous options because it's really easy to do this. So if this was not planned as a bridge, I mean, I've, there's a lot of questions about this. It's a very interesting uh, case and so on like that. Um, but obviously, you're never going to be able to clear this up. You're going to have to only do it as a bridge. But I think the more important issue is, um, you know, whether we should be doing this at all. This is not going to be answered, this thing. But interesting case. I hate it in so many ways. I know. I know. As a surgeon, I'm sure you hate it. Now, you know, when I talk to our surgeons, they never replace the valve. Just because of, for this reason. Because if the patient is not cured of their addiction, they end up infecting the, the valve. Yeah. So it's not, but it came to us after two operations elsewhere, and it was, it was in shock, so. But I think this is interesting. You said that means we do replace the valves. Uh, I think cutting out the tricuspid and leaving it behind is more, I would say, less experience with it compared to the replacements for endocarditis. Okay. Well, what's more important is here, physiologically, TR is always better tolerated than TS. Mm -hmm. So using that NGO, WAC uh, tool, you could actually, with, if you can eliminate all these vegetations, leaflets are going to come out anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think this patient will be left with quite a lot of TR with less leaflet. He can go into the drug rehab, and if he passes that, he might actually benefit. I wouldn't operate on this patient for that reason. I, mean, I would use angiovac, get the vegetations out, and then see how it does, and then take it from there. So when you reoperate, do you put a new prosthesis or do you leave it wide open? Exactly. So if you're going to excise all this and leave TR anyway, might as well do it with the angiovac. You remove all the vegetations and leave the TR behind. And that okay. way the patient doesn't have to go through, as Dr. Bowling said, you know, a third time reop in a critical situation. Yes, sir. Yeah, it sucked the leaflets, right? The leaflets will come sucking out. I mean, they do come out. Uh, they, they all. Do, we have done that. I think Paul's here. So there, there is a times. surgical series where they just took the valvectomy and left them without a valve, and everybody sort of points to that. So the, the acute follow-up, of course, this guy's 29 years old. He'll do fine with severe TR for a while. But the follow-up of all those patients, they were done in Detroit, in downtown Detroit. They were all dead. They all died either from their TR, but most of them died from continued addiction, or they got shot to death in a 7-Eleven holdup or something like that. They're all dead. That is not an option to leave young people with TR. There's a question out of the back. Thank you. So the use of angiovac or other aspiration devices for this scenario is, is I think, appropriate because your, your problem was hemodynamic. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times that we get asked to do that, people are referring the patient thinking that we're going to cure their endocarditis, which that does not do. Um, the leaflets do not always come out. Um, I have an interesting case where we had to tug with two arms, uh, actually two operators, to try and pull uh, a vegetation that was hemodynamically significant and attached to a leaflet, and it did not come off. So it's variable in the pathology. I think doing it to remove the tricuspid stenotic uh, effects is very appropriate. Valvuloplasty on the right side of the heart for prosthetic valves, you know, is, as you demonstrated, can be a safe uh, alternative that many of us wouldn't choose to do on the left side of the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great tool in your toolbox. Um, but we also have fair experience where patients come in in septic shock have these mob highly mobile vegetations on the tricuspid valve, and aspirating them just macerates them and frankly releases more bacteria systemically in a way that their septic response gets worse and they die from septic shock quite acutely. So it's always, I think, a gamble in a lot of these cases where if it's not the problem of tricuspid stenosis, then I'm very reticent anymore to aspirate these because occasionally they get better, occasionally they get much worse and die, um, and frequently it just doesn't change much of anything. So um, it's a complicated scenario that I think is we're presented with pretty commonly. With more tools, we need more guidelines on what's really going to help. Bruce? Um, I know you're one of the panelists here. What would you, would you have tackled this case? Have you seen this and what would you do? It's 
Sam, so we've actually, we have seen some similar cases. We have not tackled it with the Angiovac, but we've been talking with the folks from Angiovac. Obviously, it's off-label, so they can't promote it. Um, we've seen some similar cases where it was done successfully. We haven't tried it ourselves. Uh, ballooning, I would have been concerned about the, you know, embolic piece of it, but it looks like you got away with it in this case. And, and again, you know, our surgeons, I think also, as Dr. Bowling said, would be very averse to offering this patient a third operation. So I think that for us would have been the challenge if we were to do something like a, like a balloon, just to palliate the acute issues, you know, what was that going to be a bridge to? And I'm not sure what the answer is for that. Yeah, I think we can all sit here as like a, the Monday morning quarterback and be like, ah, but when you have a 20-something-year-old come in who's actively dying, it really hits, you know, everyone. And so you feel like you need to do something. Just, um, I mean, just if you were going to use an angiofac, like the hemodynamics, because you grow up ask, you know, to pull like two to three liters of flow, you know, just to suck out the vegetation and put it back in, if the big guy's already in shock, they may not tolerate it unless yeah, you, you know, want to put the patient on something like ECMO. So, I mean, it, it's not just an angiovac. And yes, there is an alpha vac thing that, you know, just you, you, you pump things with your hand and it sucks out vegetations. But, you know, then you have the blood loss associated with just taking that thing out. And no one's gonna want to refilter that blood and give it back. So, um, it's not as simple as just sucking it out. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. So let's move on to Steve Bowling in surgical tricuspid intervention. So I just want to comment on that. We, when Angiovac first came out, we thought, hey, great idea. And I think, Nick, you said, when you muck around in there, you release every evil humor known to man. And what's happened is we mucked around with some, and then we ended up with them on ECMO, somebody we didn't want to operate on in the first place. Oh, boy, that's a good situation. Anyways, uh, I love titles like this, like ultimate TR case, like ultimate, like the next to last one I'm gonna do or something like that. So where's Paul? I just wanna say, thanks, Paul. And I say, what kind of case was I supposed to show? So, all right, here we go. I'm gonna show you this one, this multiple fungal endocarditis that I put back together again. No, I'm not gonna show you that. That's what surgeons always do. They show you like, I'm a total badass, and this has nothing to do with catheter therapy, okay? So I'm not going to show you that one, although it was a great case. Here we go. It was a trick, wasn't it? It was good. So a 77-year-old man comes in, New York Heart Class 3, severe TR, had an AVR, had a maze at the same time, had his left atrial appendage clipped, and of course had heart block after that, and has had a pacemaker in for two and a half years. He's still an AFib, the maze didn't work, he's, got, he's a big smoker, and he's a drinker, and he likes to drink, and he's not going to stop. So that's what it is? Okay, fine. And his creatinine is 1.5, and his billy is 2.0, and he has a MELD score of 15. And those of you who know the MELD score, you don't want that patient. You don't want to do anything to that patient. Now, is his MELD score from his alcohol, or is, that, is it from his wide open TR he clearly has had for a couple years? We don't know. So here's his echo, and when I look at this, I see on the 3D that that pacemaker lead, I can't tell if it's actually through the leaflet, which unbelievably cardiologists do quite frequently, put it right through the leaflet, not through the valve, it's not a pigeon, but pierce right through it. I don't know how they do that, but so for whatever reason, he has severe TR. So this is the second leading cause of TR that we now see as surgeons. First is functional TR, and now the second leading cause is pacemaker-related TR. And it's 10% of the leads that they put in, and it's almost instantaneously when they put it in. So this is a huge problem that we see, and of course, they put a pacemaker in and then they do it under fluoro or don't really look and the next thing you know it's years gone by and the patient has had terrible TR. What to do? So there's a lot of things. You can do medical therapy. Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't work because they have torrential obligatory TR. You, you can diurese them till they're dead and you won't get rid of their TR because it's being held open. So how about pull the lead or put in a lead list? So pulling the lead again, I talked about it this morning. That is. This has been in two and a half years, but the average time that we see a patient for after surgery is 72 months. So that is like holding your arm out for six years and then trying to take, play tennis with it. It won't happen. And of course, half of them are through the leaflet itself, and that won't happen. So what about transcatheter repair? 
either with a clip or maybe TTVR. We tried all those things. What about surgical repair or replacement? What do we do with the epicardial leads? Do we put an epicardial lead on? Do we put a CS lead on? Or do we just jail the lead in place? Our EP people hate that concept. So here's what we did. Oh, oftentimes you see it right through the leaflet like this. Uh, I think all the EP people have this interesting concept that it curls right around and goes absolutely through the center of the tricuspid valve every single time. I've never seen that in my life once. And this is often the scenario you go in there and you're not gonna be able to pull that lead. And if somebody lasers it the heck out of there, they're gonna take a big chunk of leaflet out with them. And again, the average time at which you know, we see it is six years after implant. So these people have had torrential TR for the longest time. And then literally I've had patients come to me, like this guy came to me, and his biggest symptom was his shoes did not fit anymore. He had to buy bigger shoes. He had so much edema. So you can clip them, and we've tried to do that. And because of clipping them, you have to basically jail the lead in there, because oftentimes you have to clip on both sides of the lead. So what did we do? Well, we went through a thoracotomy. Not every patient has to have a reduced thoracotomy. So we went through a little tiny thoracotomy, and of course, we put a ring on it. And you can see this one was not through the leaflet. And so we increased the zonal coaptation. The septal leaflet was quite fibrotic. And then we just nailed it to the ring. We actually sewed this to the ring because the way the wire was, the pacemaker lead was sitting, it wanted to impinge against the posterior leaflet and it was pulling it out. So we just tucked it right there so it was competent. Now, what I say is you've got to talk to your EP people before you do this. You've got to have a plan of what you're going to do with the leads before you do it. So quite competent at the time. We did this with the beating heart, so we don't make the heart ischemic and so on like that. And this is our result. This is a QT result, and that's the six-month result, which is pretty good. And that is the same pacemaker he's had in there. So I think when we see these patients with pacemaker TR, and all of us are going to see them more frequently, this is an approach. Surgery is actually quite reasonable approach. We jail almost all the pacemaker leads now. I know Second or third time redo, I'm not going to dig out the LV. That's just excess work and going to give mortality to somebody. And I just jailed the lead either in the corner or like I did in this one. I just sewed it to the ring itself. Now, here's another one. Three leads through the tricuspid valve. And you take a close look at, yeah, it's right through the tricuspid valve. So he has three leads through there. He's, you can see he's got one through, two through the septal leaflet and one through the posterior leaflet. Good shot. So, yeah, so it's through the valve, all right, yeah. So now what are you gonna do with this? This, you can, on this one, I thought about cutting those all out and uh, fooling around with it and try and reconstruct it, but he had three leads there and it being tough for a while. So you can see I did a bovine repair on it. So I replaced the valve and I just trapped everything outside of the valve housing itself. It sucked there. So. I think you have to be creative in thinking what you're going to do with this patient before you get in there. So it's supposed to be five minutes. I went right through it. So this is an increasing problem. We're all going to see this, and we're all going to have to deal with it when we're thinking about catheter patients, either for clipping or TTVR. Discuss with your EP beforehand. So talk to them about a pacemaker uh, concept beforehand. And you can be creative as a surgeon. And replacement may be needed, both surgical replacement or even TTDVR. We've put catheter valves in and just trap the pacemaker out to the side, and that works just fine for these patients. Thanks. So, Nadira. Let me ask you. I mean, we kind of touched on this a little bit uh, on the last session. So do you think that we should change the rec or make recommendations or uh, that all anybody who goes and gets a pacemaker should have an echo before and then one after? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, we see so much. I mean, I remember back in my fellowship days uh, with my mentor, we were trying to work with our EP folks to try and guide them, but it's theoretically, it's logistically, it's so hard because for us to be under the II machine, the fluoroscopy radiation as well. I think it would be very beneficial mm -hmm. to follow them up closely. Like you said, everybody agree that uh, early screening and early catch of this TR as well and whether it's associated, um, I think 
to catch them early, I think that would be the first step, especially in this cohort of patients. And what do you think we should do if we see like leaflets, uh, sorry, leads through the leaflets? So most of the time when we see it, it's not pierced through. That happens occasionally, but I think it's because of their concept of how much slack they're leaving right there. If they leave a lot of slack and it just pushes the door open, maybe they can come up and pull the leaflet back up under, I mean, pull the lead back up under echo guidance or something to see if the TR goes away. Now you can only do that, you know, I'd say within three months or something of implantation. Once you're in there for a while, it's gonna be pretty stiff. But I, I, I think the fact that they do these and never have any echo follow-up or any echo guidance is a misguided. A suggestion that I tried with my EP folks in my previous institution was to be in the room, but logistically it was so hard because we're running tr towards the room to try and guide them during the yeah. implantation. That was an idea that we had uh, to help them. Um, but you know, we could get really good transthoracic images, but it's just logistically, putting the, a pacemaker lead is so easy and fast. So having us there as an imager may prolong the procedure as well. So these are the factors, but, ser but really f close follow-up, really, with the echo. So our EPs just recently, I guess, um, there's more of a recommendation now to go further up on the septum or something away from the, the you know, and it's pushing the leaflet, uh, the lead closer to the posterior leaflet now. We've had two cases of acute TR in, in people, and one of the ladies died. I mean, even when we try, it was just too, so. Yeah, yeah Molly, I mean, it's, it's so the, the his bundle pacing yeah, is what bundle. people are really advocating now. So instead of going down to the RV apex, is right, putting it up in the septum. But what that does is it dings the septal leaflet. Uh, you know, and they're trying to get around it with a four French temporary le or four French lead. You know, it's you know the tinies or two French. I mean, they're they're super tiny, but if you pierce through the septal leaflet, as Steve has already shown, it doesn't really matter. And right. that's exactly where they're going is right in that septum uh, to get that his bundle physiological pacing. I mean, it, at least get an echo within the first ten years after a year no pacer would be <laughs> some kind of guideline. For God's sakes, it's six years. We've seen patients who've had TR for a long time, and they come back. No matter what you do, they're already cooked. The other thing I would say is that to your comment about the slack, it actually is less slack is better. Oh, because, less slack is way better. What happens because, is because, there's too much slack, and it curves. Yeah. Well, like that. what they need is uh, they need it to be taut because when it's taut, it gets pulled in the interceptal commissure. Uh, whereas a, more slack actually pushes in all different directions and it's unpredictable. Right. So. right. I, I think Anita, I think, had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, at the HRS, I wasn't there, but one of the big discussions was this concept of jailing these pacemaker leads, risk of endocarditis, and that electrophysiology wants to be more involved in these decisions. You know, is it unreasonable to think that maybe they should be trained in intracardiac echo and be using it when they're putting these leads in? You know, maybe we can't always have an echocardiographer with them. But considering the, the breadth of the problems that you know, they're contributing to, maybe that's something that you know, we need to think about. Agreed, and we've talked to RIPs about that, and their response is usually that there's just no way they could feasibly image every single patient at the time of a pacer implant, the workflow issues, the cost issues. But I would say that we sh it would behoove us to get them more involved in the planning and the discussion. So we talk through all of our lead patients uh, with TR, with our EP team. We're fortunate to work with a high volume extractor. His perception is that, and, and, and when we go to these types of conferences, that there is um, the perception of risk involved with lead extraction in the interventional community is much, much higher than it actually is in real life. And he'll tell us his risk of extraction. Yes, there's those bad cases where you know a tricuspid comes out, but the reality is that's an extremely low volume event. The likelihood of someone needing to go for something you know urgent cardiac surgical is very low but that we're kind of like putting this out there that you know lead extraction is a bad thing. And we're not saying every lead needs to be extracted, but their point is if you have a patient and you send them to an EP who is not a high volume extractor, their perception of, oh, well, I'm not gonna take this out, it's a five-year-old lead, versus someone who does this all the time would say like, this lead's gonna come out in two minutes and it's gonna be a very low risk, less than 1% of having a bad outcome, and it probably should be considered. So, so I, if I lead extraction is so easy, how come they have to have cardiac, cardiac surgery, surgery on standby every <laughs> damn time, huh? And, 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 and our guy will say he doesn't need that, but it's uh -huh. what the institution so requires. So. I would think that that would depend on the reason why they're lead extracting. If, yeah. the, if the patient has a lead extraction because they have severe TR, then I would think there's a higher risk of 
hurting the tricuspid valve as opposed to moving it because it's fractured or whatever other reason why they leave. Think and the other thing in terms of follow-up, I mean, every single mitral repair we do at Michigan, a cabillion of them gets a surface cycle before they go home. Why can't we just get a surface cycle? Not in the lab, not in the EP lab, but before they head out. You know, we're still talking about EPs and putting in pacemakers, but there's still a large volume of pacemakers that are put in by general cardiologists in, in areas. And I can probably say that those people aren't following up on the new valve technologies in, in this. So, I mean, I think it's a lot of education all around. I mean, Molly, there are so many gaps, and this is a bigger problem for TTVR, actually. And there's a conversation now that... Sure, we see some statistics, but what's the denominator, and et cetera. So we are going to learn more as we go forward into associated and caused and et cetera. All right. I think Faraz is, like, ready to give his talk. He's, uh, <laughs> he, he, he's, he's telling us to be quiet, so he's going to talk to us on Perkins. I, I think it must be pacemaker-related, is it? Uh, Let me, uh, I think I'm the ad in the middle between... Uh, number eight and number nine. I asked Paul, like, what is, what is the ultimate case number nine mean? And he goes, well, you know, there would be an eight cases better than yours by the time you get to present. <laughs> but you failed to tell me that number eight was Steve Bowling, all right? <laughs> I didn't get my slides. Oh, see? I got Steve Bowling slides. Here we go. Here we'll yeah, here we go. So I'm going to present, uh, you know, very quickly, the ultimate structural case tricuspid number nine, and my slides are not advancing. You can put Steve's slide back. Yeah. They're easier. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, there's no doubt that tricuspid valve interventions are very challenging. And we just learned from Dr. Bowling that they're also challenging for the surgeon as well. So, uh, you know, I'm going to present a, a really challenging case that we faced in clinic. This is a trifecta challenge, somebody who has a, a mitral valve, an aortic valve, and a lead. And if this is not enough, notice how tethered that septal leaflet is. And, you know, this is extremely functional, plus pacemaker, plus tethered uh, septal leaflet, torrential you know, TR, it probably started with this patient undergoing double valve replacement at some point during their life, complicated by a pacemaker post-op, and you know, uh, was, got an echo periodically, and unfortunately, a few years later, this is the anatomy that we are dealing with. And in this case, we decided that we were just not gonna uh, see it very well on transthoracic, and we did it with, uh, with ice. And this is uh, the evoke valve that we put in this case. We're able to push the lead to the side, you know, go underneath that uh, septal leaflet. And with the, with the ice, we were able to put uh, uh, the, uh, the evoke valve. I think that this case would have been extremely challenging with uh, repair. We have chosen to proceed with replacement. And this case was purely based on anatomical challenges and imaging challenges. I want to present uh, another case where similar scenario. Uh, this is also somebody who this time got a mechanical uh, uh, left-sided valve as well as a lead. Again, the same story, got complicated by pacemaker post, uh, by heart block post-op, got a pacemaker, and now a uh, few years later has you know, torrential TR. And I think that we all agree that this case is also going to be extremely challenging to put it in uh, with, a, with, with, with any repair uh, technology, especially tier. And if you look at the lead and how it's floating in the, uh, uh, um, how is it floating in the tricuspid analyst? And by the way, so we have a tricuspid ring. Yeah, there's a tricuspid ring there. There's a lead. It's in horizontal heart. And there is a mechanical aortic valve that is in the way of, uh, you know, of, 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 uh, of seeing the anatomy. This case would have been challenging no matter how you want to do it. And in this case, we decided to treat this patient with the, uh, with the intrepid valve. You know, and the ring was actually you know, helpful as well because it was a fluoroscopic uh, marker about where, uh, where we should uh, land that valve. And uh, you will see with NPR, we were able to get perpendicular to the analyst. 
and this is the valve being deployed. All of the, the leads, as well as all of the leaflets get pushed to the side. You don't have to worry about anchoring under the leaflet. And this is the final result. Uh, the valve sat down in the uh, first and second row, no PVL and trace valve or leak with very acceptable gradient. So to conclude, TTVR has many technical and imaging challenges and 3DTE and MPR are critical and ICE adds significant value in those. Those cases are difficult to treat with the repair, especially with tricuspid tear and uh, tricuspid replacement can be an option for them. And the technical, the technical success is very acceptable in this early experience, including when the anatomy is challenging or if there's a pacemaker. And uh, CT is uh, critical to understand how we approach uh, those anatomy. And the future might include uh, multiple uh, valve replacement technology to handle all of those challenges that we can face in the tricuspid anatomy. Thank you. So Nadira, since you're the imager on the uh, panel, are there certain things that you can do to help optimize uh, imaging when you have things like um, mechanical valves in the aortic or mitral position? I would say it's really challenging. Um, from the T perspective, I think mid-esophageal, you know, plus minus, most of the time you can't. The distal esophageal is one of those views that I love to try and get rid of that aorta, uh, mechanical or mitral, uh, transgastric. And then once you get a good 2D or 3D MPR, but sometimes when you have so much uh, soft, you know, hardware in there, that's where I think the eye imaging really helped, which I think for us showed really nicely. I think that's like everybody would know from this morning, it's a game changer, like you mentioned, Molly, really has ease, at least gives confidence to both interventionists and imager as well. So we don't have to sweat behind the heavy lead that we use and you know uh, efficiency as well. Certainly is um, you know, not only game changer, but I think with practice, we'll get faster at doing this. So procedural times as well. Out of curiosity, when you guys do ICE, uh, do you have the Im Im imager doing the, or just the, uh, like, sonographer doing the, the recons? And how are you guys going to set that up? Yeah, so it varies on inst uh, institutions. I think uh, the thing, uh, the key point is that the roles are reversed now. So the interventionists or surgeons are holding the probe. And so, like I always say, I love saying to Paul, get me the best image now. <laughs> it's my time. <laughs> but, you know, optimize the image for me, Paul. I'll wait for you. Yeah, I knew I was going to say She loves saying that. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. But, you know, and that's the key thing. Don't use it for the, you know, when you use it for the first case, be very patient. Uh, take your time because it's a learning curve. That's what we had as well in the first couple of cases. Um, and that's when you practice and the workflow really helps. And the other thing is because the roles are reversed, the communication, you know, between the imager and the interventionist. And us, imager, I think is key as well, the sonographer if in, in, in your institution because you're handling the console, doing the 3D MPR, aligning it. I think we still need, have a huge role in that. One quick question for Faras and, and for anyone else in the audience. We, we have not trapped any leads behind a device uh, because I would be killed at our institution. But um, um, the question is, was the patient pacer dependent? And has anyone seen any issues with trapping a lead and creating lead or pacing dysfunction as a result? So if they were pacer dependent, would you be less likely to do it uh, than if they weren't or no? Because I think there's been some reports of some trapped leads that over time develop some dysfunction and may not reliably pace. So in the trial, um, if you were pacemaker dependent, they wouldn't let you. If it was just a pacemaker lead, they would. And with ICD leads, they wouldn't either. But that's just in the trial. Uh, we, we've trapped leads and, and I've tra we worried about that or even that we were acutely going to rip them out because as we expand, we catch it and pull it back, you know, up into the atrium a little bit. We've not seen that. We've not had a pacemaker go out. No, they kind of sit nicely um, yeah. w when you trap them behind you. Yeah, we've done plenty. So uh, I, I, I think uh, this, this discussion, sorry to say that it just shows our ignorance in this field. So 
uh, pacing leads are not one pacing lead. There are many manufacturers, uh, many insulation types, many diameters. So let's not say I had experience with 10 leads, so 11th is OK. The second thing is, that's a great question. So for the interpret TTVR, if patient's pacing dependent, and we have a threshold for that, we actually advocate either placing a micra or another coronary sinus LV pacing before we approve the patient. And I think this is really important. And uh, that's what my other question to Firaz was, like, if this patient wasn't actually dependent, but now you can see the angulation, how do we monitor these patients for future? Because that's also critical. Today they are not dependent, but maybe after some time, and although anecdotal, there are now, we know that there are some lead fracture cases with even, I would say, with sapien valves used in tricuspid, forget uh, TTVR devices. So, I mean, I, I agree. Like, there is no doubt that uh, pacemaker-related uh, issues are a challenge for TTVR. Whether it's they pre-exist and you need to put a valve in or, you know, the heart, ry uh, heart rhythm issues afterwards that you need to put a pacemaker after the TTVR. I think, uh, I think you know, your, your comment is, is, is spot on. Not all leads are alike. And we, we've seen a little bit difference in how we manage, uh, how, what is the impact of the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, we have trapped few leads, in, uh, and we still follow them uh, up to a year. And, but we had a couple that, uh, you know, the threshold went up, and, uh, and, you know, we have to replace the lead. So I think some leads will have an impact. And it's hard to know at this point if it's lead specific or a, or a valve specific. The question about ICD is, is, is also a big question, whether it's a primary prevention or a secondary prevention. I mean, all of those have implication to, you know, to the patients. And I think as we know more about what the TTVR trials are going to show us, you know, it's going to bring the risk benefit conversation for the patients who have leads. Can I just ask one question about <clears throat> when you're planning your TTVR and you're going to trap the lead? Do you guys model for how mobile the lead is in there? And the reason why I ask is because I was looking at your Intrepa deployment, and it looked like the lead was pretty taut when you finished the deployment, almost like it was going to be pulled atrial. I mean, does, is that part of the planning? So, so one thing that we start looking at is, you know, the, the leads get stuck on the cava RA junction, and that create that, you know, tension on the lead. One thing that we have done is try to engineer where we want to jail the leads. And, you know, early on that would help. And you want to jail posterior, you want to jail septal, and you can control that how you cross your valve initially or how you cross with the, with the wire, depends on what uh, TTVR valve you're using. But, you know, you're right, Paul, we start looking at it more carefully, but we also start to engineer where we want the lead trapped. We have also snared some leads just to pull them in directions where we want them to, uh, you know, to be trapped. But with, uh, with, with more and more comfort with managing the lead, we're able to do it just simply with the way we cross with the wire and the valve. Can I ask you an imaging question? So I know well, ICE is great and it's the best thing in 2023. And, uh, but uh, is it device specific? What I mean is every device is deployed differently. So design implications in doing the procedure is going to be important. So the way Interpid is you know, deployed is different than EOS. So do you find it, is it device agnostic or do you need better imaging for a particular device? I think most of the cases, you know, TE is enough for TTVR. And you know, if the leaflet devices like the Evoke, or you want to make sure that all the anchors are are uh, are captured with the uh, with the or engaged with the with the valve, you just need a little bit more reassurance. Especially that first case where you know there was a lot of challenges in in images, we found ice helpful. But unlike uh, we have the same practice that you have for tricuspid tier, where we put ice in every single catheter, in every single uh, tier procedure. We don't do that for TTVR. Only the minority we use, uh, we use ice. The majority of them just DEE only. Have you done an evoke with pacemaker leads and multiple leads? Does that have a problem because you can't see as well with all the stuff you have? That, that, that's the, the, the first case I showed, and we yeah. used ice for that case. So the, and, and, and that's why I put those two cases, well, like one with Evoke and one with Intrepid. I think that you have to see something. And, uh, and I, I think that, you know, the, uh, 
you know, just the ability to see the analysts only is, is an advantage for Intrepid as opposed to having to see the, you know, the leaflet. But even with seeing the leaflets with ICE is, 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 is feasible. And, uh, but it gets challenging. I mean, with the anatomy like this, and once you deploy the brim of the Intrepid, then imaging become even more challenging. And a lot of it is just, you know, kind of remember where the analyst is and we use that to land it on. So Firas, why not place eyes through transeptal into the LV? Say that again, Vinny. Why not put the ice probe through transeptal into the LV and yeah. may get you actually better images on the right side. So maybe next year you can show a case. Yeah, we, next year we'll do it. <laughs> Is that will be ultimate case number 11. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, Hirsch Nike's going to do gratitude for ice. Thank you. So I guess number 10 means that I'm the worst case or the <laughs> best case. I don't know. So, um, so gratitude for ice. Uh, Paul asked me to talk about this, not ice because of the heat, but ice because of intracardiac echo. <clears throat> so disclosures for uh, this talk particularly. So this is a 53-year-old male with a history of shortness of breath, despite medical therapy. He has a mechanical aortic valve replacement, mechanical mitral valve replacement, two different surgeries, uh, two different times, uh, AFib and severe TR. So here's our echo. So severe TR, prominent eustachian valve, probably atrial MR rate, uh, normal RV function, normal LV function. And again, severe TR centrally, atrial TR. So he, he was enrolled in the continued access of the triluminate study. And here's us getting our triclip into position around the eustachian valve, which was a little difficult. And now look at our TE. So pre-op TE and now this, the, the procedure TE, severe, I mean, you can't see anything now, but severe except for severe TR. So how am I going to implant? So this is when we switch to um, ICE. And you can see here, we see ICE is much better than TE here. You can see the septal and anterior leaflets. And in fact, I'm able to even steer down in ICE. Um, so doing the whole case uh, under ICE, at least to steer down, we had a septal hugger, so we corrected that, all under um, intracardiac echo. And you can even identify the gripper. You guys see the gripper come down on the septal leaflet? And so now, this is, I call this the rich man's NPR, because we're using ICE, you know, a $3,000 device to um, get um, orthogonal images, but... Wait, you only paid $3,000? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm, yeah. Uh, I get a bundle deal, Paul. So, um, so now we're able to position this, I don't think this case, we would have been able to do this case without ICE. Um, and again, you know, sometimes, and Paul and I have talked about this before, before ICE, I used to grab the leaflets in transgastric um, and X-plane, as you see on the left image, and then do the whole grasping in that view. But you can't really tell the, the curling of the leaflets, I think, on transgastric when you don't have good T images up top. And so this helped us with that. And you can see that I have the anterior leaflet um, on ICE there. And so we lowered the anterior gripper. And then we moved, sept clocked it, moved septally, and grabbed the uh, septal leaflet, you could see there. And I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing this under um, transgastric, especially now that I have uh, ice here. And so now we're able to uh, orient our, our arms, and you can see that in transgastric. So, and this is the beauty of the Phillips. I don't, I don't have any disclosures with Phillips, so I'm just telling you that it, you can toggle back between ice and uh, TE easily, and that's what we are doing here. But you can see our orientation of our arms are good. They're on the same coaptation plane of the anterior septal leaflet. And then we close the 60 and then fully close. Again, I used to do this with that when we didn't do it with ice. This is how we used to close, but you didn't, I wouldn't, didn't, never felt comfortable about curling of the leaflets. Again, TE, so now we're trying, uh, TE versus ice, we're trying to figure out if the leaflet insertion is good. It looks good to me here, and it especially looks good here when we deploy, and you can see the anterior septal leaflets inside the uh, clip. Okay, so now we continue to have um, TR that we need to treat, and so we're going to place another clip medially. Again, TEE did not show anything that well, and now I'm uh, p placing a second clip, and again, it doesn't, it's not very equipment specific as opposed to TEE, you know, the second clip you still see as clearly, at least in this case, and you can see that lateral leaflet coming down, right, the anterior, sorry, the gripper. 
on the anterior side coming down. So now we just uh, place this under the valve. We went, we did this on transgastric and um, uh, X-plane as, um, as well as ice to make sure that we were underneath the leaflets. Pulled the DC handle back and we're coming up under the leaflets here. And then now we're able to see both leaflets. We didn't need independent grasping here. We placed both grippers down. And you can see, I sometimes use fluoro too. I don't know if you can see it that clearly, but you know, you don't have a lot of tactile feedback on the uh, tricuspid valve. And so sometimes you can't tell if the grippers are um, in or not, and you can't feel that. Um, you can certainly see it on fluoro, and then you can confirm in IC. You guys see that gripper moving on fluoro? So it's kind of a nice uh, adjunct there. But I see both grippers, I think, on ice on the, uh, on the bottom right image too. And then here's our transgastic again for the second clip. And then we're closed at 60. And now we're fully closed. And again, we don't see that well on TEE to confirm our uh, leaflet insertion. But as I explain through clip one and clip two and rotate the uh, ice a little bit, you can see that um, uh, you can get the sense, not even the sense, you're confirmed that you have the septum, septal leaflet and lateral leaflet inside the clip. And then here's what the, uh, oh, can I go back? Here's the TR with, the, uh, with it still attached. And then we actually uh, thought we saw a tissue bridge here, so this is just more confirmation on 3D ice. And then we deployed the clip, and that's very clear that both uh, leaflets are in. And only trace TR left. So key learnings, pre-procedure echo can often differ when the device is in, so be prepared. I think you can do 80% or 90% of your uh, um, uh, tricuspid cases with TEE, but you can probably do 100% of them with TEE and ICE. So have that ready, early introduction of ICE, and then sometimes, like I said, the rich man's poor uh, uh, MPR, you can use the combination of ICE and TEE together to uh, confirm your insertion. So I think uh, I'm taking Molly's uh, questioning of Paul a little bit further. So now you've got you have put two clips. You have used more expensive instruments. How do you justify this? I mean, we <laughs> surgeons get hammered. They feel better by using a valve. I mean, no, but this is yeah. serious conversation. No, you're right. Should this be a bundle with, say, Edwards and Abbott, who are essentially giving us these tools, uh, which is tier? Yeah. But at the same time, I see more and more that the dependence is going to be on imaging. And here we have got a disposable imaging uh, as against a TE probe, which can be used 1,000 times. So I think there has to be some conversation at higher level from interventionists and see how this can be justified because it's needed for good result. Yeah. So we and can't compromise good results. And even bundling it maybe with capital equipment too, right? So TE the, the probes, the ice probes, the echo machine, and the cath lab um, equipment. Yeah, they're going to have to because yeah. it's just it just increases exponentially the cost. And there's a lot of good programs that they just, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of them are not going to be able to, to get the ice catheters. They already yeah. aren't, so. And there are gonna be cases you can't do without ice. I mean, Paul, you agree now that you've been using ice, so it's, you know. I think that's going to be, in my mind, mm -hmm. uh, you know, important question in future. And do you think, like with millipede, uh, although it's not used now, we saw that the probe and the delivery system was married together. Do you see any value in future whether such innovation will make life easier for various devices uh, or it's probably not needed? I mean, yeah. this was fairly easy, but I, 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 no, I agree with that, yeah. Using AI too to like kind of confirm where your positioning is uh, or you know, based on the anatomy, moving the ice catheter to where you want without I mean, the technology is going there, so. I mean, we need to see like a surgeon. I mean, you, you guys have the, the privilege of being able to open the body and see directly as to what you're doing. We piece everything together from multiple planes of imaging trying to see what you see. Guys, and if uh, only there was like a machine where you could support the body and stop the heart and then look inside of it, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> When that happens, and go home the next day. When, when that happens... Uh, <laughs> well, not that awesome. <laughs> you know, but I think uh, we are not far from that, right? In terms of, 
it's other way around as well. And I can tell you that uh, every time we see something as a surgeon, it's not necessarily gold standard. I, you know, we have what? recently, what? it's not, it's, it, it may be better. But for example, aortic valve sizing, uh, you know, we have shown and applied that CT sizing is better than actual what surgeon size on the table. So we, we are learning both sides. But I think taking this concept forward, uh, the three mencio has now a plug-in where you can simulate. Because when you do TE outpatient, patients like this, well, when you do the procedure, they're supine. So when CT is done, it's in the same position as when it would be, you know, you're doing your procedure. So now they have that TE plug-in or whatever where you can manipulate the probe and which will give you the cross-sections. So I think you can predict somehow what, you know, probe position should be, which will give you the best thing. And I think to this point, we are not far from there. Obviously not in real, you know, you will not see it as a surgeon hopefully, but I think otherwise. Yeah. So at our place, we have a real team approach, and I'm going to challenge people in the audience. How many of you have scrubbed into a surgical valvular case? Good. I think everyone should do that. That helps your imaging as uh, a structural IC because you know what you're going to look at. Well, I do the clips myself, and I know when I get tangled on something or a yank on something, I know when I'm yanking on there. I think it's really helpful. Also helps the team approach to have your cardiologist scrub into a case and poke around the mitral valve and poke around the tricuspid. I mean, when you visualize the cords underneath, especially on the tricuspid side, it makes you a lot more scared when you do the <laughs> procedure, you know? All right, I think uh, this was a wonderful symposium. Lunch symposium is at 1215 right here. All right.